Broadcasting live from Baltimore, Maryland, the Breath of Life Ministries presents Experience the Power. When God gets ready, He can deliver you. If you call on Him, if you trust in Him, He's worthy of the praise. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. And now let's go live to the Miracle Temple Worship Center, where our service is in progress. Would you turn in your Bibles to the 19th chapter of Luke? I think they're going to put this up for you. Uh, in fact, they told me to read from the, uh, the prompter. I don't know if I can do that. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I would like to ask if anyone happens to see my Bible clearly on the air, that you would refrain from criticizing me. As poor as I am, I can't afford a new Bible. But there's something wonderful about Bibles you know. This one has been a companion for a couple of years. I wear them out about two and a half years apiece, and it's got some funny places. Don't, don't talk about me. Leave me alone. This is a good Bible. I can flip it open. It'll fall to the right places. It's a good Bible. Luke chapter 19. I only really need three verses to launch us in the place that we need to be. Uh, here is what the Bible says, starting from verse 1. Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. I've entitled our time together tonight, Dinner with a Sinner. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I don't have it. I wish that I had the power to, to speak for you. I wish that I could make my words be Jesus' words. But I can only do that when I surrender everything I have and everything I am to you and let you use me. So Father, take what little I bring. It's not nearly enough. But I remember that Jesus took a little boy's lunch and broke it and broke it and broke it and multiplied it until it was enough and there was something left over. So tonight, take what I bring and please do the same thing so that when we leave tonight, we will know that we have heard from God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus comes into a beautiful place. This is large living territory. Uh, when, you, when you leave Jerusalem going through Jericho, you pass through places that are tropical in nature. Palm trees, rich gardens that are fed not by some gardener, but by living springs of water. In fact, the place is so beautiful that one of my favorite writers says it looks like an emerald against those rugged hills. It's a beautiful city and everybody wants to live there. It had anciently been known as a place for priests to live. And you may say much about preachers, but you might have to admit that preachers know nice places to live. <laughs> well, you keep your jokes to yourself, but you know preachers. And the priests had made that a place where many priests lived. And uh, you would think that if priests lived there, we would make it uh, just kind of monolithic, but it was not, because not only were priests there, but there were also living there, because customs had to be collected when the caravans passed. There were customs collectors known as publicans. Publicans were just as popular then as the IRS is now. I hope there's nobody here tonight who's with the IRS. <laughs> and if you are, I hope you don't take personal umbrage because I'd hate to be audited because of my sermon. <laughs> but, but there were the priests and the publicans and then passing through with the caravans, there were Roman officers, there were powerful 
Roman officers that would come through and change the landscape as they traveled. So now you've got a place that not only has religious people, but people who collect customs and taxes, and here's the word on the street. Some of these gentlemen, and I find only gentlemen in all the things that I read, some of them collect more than they should. So you already owe more than you want to pay. But now comes some uh, creative entrepreneur who says, I will charge more than you owe. Can you imagine how much people love these folks? Not only did they charge what you owe, but they'd add a little bit. And you know how it is. You, you can't really win with them. So somebody would say, hey, I don't owe that. Well, today you do. And if you don't pay it, can you imagine what will happen? So this was a hated class of people. But the man I'm about to talk about is hated way more than that. You see, this was a Roman authority taxing basically a Jewish people. So you already got a little hatred because you're charging me taxes. I'm already a little mad because you charge me too much. But now you throw in a difference in nationality so you got a little twist on the hatred. Can you feel where I am? So they, they are a hated people. Among the hated class called the publicans, there is a Jewish man. We know he's Jewish. His name is Zacchaeus. The name Zacchaei is a name that one of the greatest priests of that time, one of the greatest rabbis, forgive me, of that time, that's his name. So when this man announces He's a publican and then says, my name is Zacchaeus. You already got the picture. Ah, So you want my people working for another government to take more of my money than you should. I really love you. <laughs> Can you see it? So trust me, when this man went for a walk, the children were not gathering around him. The people did not speak as he passed by. In fact, I would venture to say that when Zacchaeus walked, he cleared an automatic path. Have you ever had that happen to you? Well, I'm, I'm happy there was no reaction. When Zacchaeus walked, nobody wanted to be close. What they did not know is that behind this facade, there was a different man than you might imagine. I have discovered that you cannot judge people by what they look like. Hmm? I, I could tell you stories. It would last too long. But the fact is that what a person looks like cannot represent to you who they really are. You can't judge a book by its cover. You don't know what people are really like. You cannot judge them based on these little shortcuts we take to make ourselves believe that we know what's going on. You've got to get to know somebody before you can say what they're like. Zacchaeus was in a bad class of people, but he had heard the preaching of John the Baptist. And oh, I... I have asked God, I don't know what it sounded like when John the Baptist preached, but I've read about it and I've said, Lord, can you make another preacher preach like that? I have coveted the gift that John the Baptist had. The, the man was so powerful that he was in the country preaching, but the city people with their finery on would come out to the country and sit on rocks and stumps because his preaching was so magnetic that it drew them from their beautiful places of abode and they went only to hear the words that he spoke. He did no miracles. He simply spoke the word with power and when people heard him, they were convicted. So he was preaching and Zacchaeus comes and hears about Jesus. And from that day forward, inside this heart that you would think was so cold, something went wrong. That's a secondary point. Let me tell you what I want to say to you tonight. That's germane to what we're going to be doing here from now until we leave. What I want you to see is that there would have been no politically correct reason to like Zacchaeus. You could hate him with impunity. In fact, if you wanted to be popular, 
You could make a negative comment down at the marketplace about Zacchaeus and the chorus of people would build to say, you're right. In fact, if you wanted to be popular, you should go to, I don't know, did they have barber shops? <laughs> Were there beauty shops? I go to visit my wife's beauty shop and, and I find that many stereotypes are still alive and well. You know, women when they are under those gigantic domes <laughs> still make grand assessments about our culture. They say things that they might not otherwise say, but while they're reading a magazine and they tuck their heads out for just a minute to catch what's going on and say something and a chorus joins in with them. A man is, is unprepared to go in and deal with that kind of thing <laughs> because many times they are talking about men. In fact, I told my wife, I don't want to, you know, I'll take her there, but I don't want to go in because when I walk in, they all get quiet and I know what happened. <laughs> well, ladies, uh, what you ought to know is that barbershops got a little problem too. <laughs> there are men in barbershops who say things about you. They are not true, you know. I, I, the, the quintessential barbershop comment. Some big tall guy comes in and says, when I go home, I want to hear pots rattling on the stove. In fact, I can tell you that when I step in the door, my wife is there to hand me my slippers and my newspaper. That's the kind of house I've got. Now, if you were to follow him home. <laughs> but listen, if you wanted to plug into the crowd at the beauty shop or the barber shop, you should start off with this line. The nerve of Zacchaeus. I saw him the other day rich as he can be. You see his clothes? Where does he get those clothes? And somebody would chime in, I know where he got it because he took it from me, my mother and my father. My whole family has been ripped off by that rascal and his ilk. I hate tax collectors. And all of a sudden a chorus would join in and you'd find yourself popular in conversation. But here is what I want to show you tonight. And this is, is so central to what I want to preach because there are people in this audience and audiences like this around the world tonight who believe that the only way Jesus will love you is if you're religious. I've heard them say it. You know, I, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be like my grandmother. She was a religious woman. Jesus loved her and she loved Jesus. So what you do is paint religious people in with Jesus and then paint the rest of us out here hanging on the edge. And I've heard people say, I can't go to church. I won't go to church. Because before you go to church, you got to be religious. Well, I'll tell you something. Zacchaeus was many things but nobody would have called him religious. Then I've heard people say something that's even more odd. They said, you know, one day I'd, I would like to go to church, especially when you have children. You know, when you have children and they start imitating you. Have you noticed that? My, my grown offspring who are present here tonight have cautioned me against telling certain stories, so I've had to take them out of my repertoire. So let me just say, theoretically, <laughs> theoretically, a child can watch a parent and watch you so closely that they will mimic things about you that you don't know about yourself. One of my two children came in one day from school and sat out on the couch and said, Phew, I said, what is that about? You tired? No. You have a hard day? No. Well, why did you make that noise? Because that's what you do every time you come. <laughs> no, I don't. Yes, you do. 
I said, but you know, when I come in most of the time, I'm happy. Yeah, but every time you sit down, you say, Phew. <laughs> So that's what I say. And when you finally get children, people start saying, well, maybe I ought to go to church. But I can't go to a religious situation until I'm right. See, that's like saying, I will not go to a physician until I'm well. <laughs> not going. I got a disease, but I got to cure it before I go to a doctor. <laughs> the fact is that Jesus calls people who have the disease of sin. I'm going to prove it to you. The fact is that Zacchaeus had heard that Jesus was coming in one of those caravans that passed through Jericho on the way to the feast. Uh, there, there was always some traffic. It was not small traffic. Some of us see the Bible so quaint. We paint it so pretty like somebody's little painting on a poster card or a greeting card. It was a thriving metropolis where wealthy people dwelt, where there was a great culture and a society, and, and there was always travel, somebody with goods that had to be taxed, and there was noise and dust because this was a moving society. And among all those people that passed through one day came somebody who didn't fit his name was Jesus he was the rabbi not accepted by many but the rabbi who had recently raised Lazarus from the dead don't try this at home <laughs> let me tell you something you can go through the Bible and knock a whole lot of things out but if Jesus did indeed stand before a tomb, I've been there, I've finally seen what they look like. They've got these, these gigantic circular stones and they roll them in troughs that are down and, and they seal the bodies in. Uh, at times in ancient history, uh, the Jewish nation believed that the soul tried to struggle to get back to the body so they would wait for four days before they thought somebody was finally dead and so Lazarus had been dead he had gotten the call from Mary and Martha and in fact had not gone immediately you, you couldn't figure it out if you didn't understand but sometimes Jesus had to do things that would be powerful forever if he had come immediately the Jewish people would have said the soul came back to the body so he took one day and then two days and then three days and then four days and on the fourth day Mary and Martha along with those who loved them rolled the stone to the to close that sepulcher and they said he's dead nobody can get him out of there and I say that's right nobody but Jesus <laughs> When Jesus comes, he, he says, roll, roll the stone away. I could take a long time talking about how God allows you to work with Jesus to make things happen, but you've already heard that. Jesus goes down and simply says, Lazarus, come forth. Somebody says he came running. He did not. He was wrapped. <laughs> uh. But I tell you what. If I had found myself alive, wrapped, I get some kind of way and gotten up. And then I'd have started coming out of there some kind of way. Because if I'm alive, I don't belong in a tomb anymore. People who are alive should be loosed. And that's exactly what Jesus said. So this had already happened. The, the word had already gone out. And there were plots. Listen to me. There were plots against Jesus. Greater plots because now he had shown who he was by bringing somebody back to life. So as he entered Jericho, the priests had put together schemes and plots to kill him. But look, if you're Jesus, you let the schemes and plots handle themselves. And as he comes into town, the people who know who he is throng around him. There are people in front, there are people in back. And you know a crowd has noise, 
I've heard preachers who make everything in the Bible quiet. Woe be unto you. There are some things that have a sound. People walking with Jesus have a sound. Because while Jesus walks, he heals. While Jesus walks, he forgives. While Jesus walks, he builds faith. While Jesus walks, he can tell somebody, you have hopped too long, little boy. Come here. And the little child can run now. So when Jesus walks, there is a noise. It's not an ordinary noise, but it's a noise. One of my favorite writers said, above the noise of the crowd, above the noise of the screaming, angry priests, above the noise of the joyous congregation, above the noise of the hangers-on who had no reason to know what they were walking for, they just were walking with the crowd. Above that noise, Jesus heard the mind and heart of one short publican who had climbed up a tree. His mouth wasn't talking. His life was screaming out, help me, I need somebody to help me. Nobody understands me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody will look beyond what I, I have as a profession. Nobody will stop to know who I am. But the fact is that while you aren't even talking about your situation, Jesus can hear you talking in your mind. Somebody ought to say amen. Hey, I almost used that as my experience the power moment. But here it comes. The crowd is moving. They get to the place where this well-dressed man is in a tree. Come on. Come on. You got on clothes from Kmart. You might be in a tree. You're rich, you got on matching stuff, you got a little metal entwined in it, you're not up a tree. Well-dressed people don't climb trees, but if your heart is empty, if your brain aches for someone to fill the vacuum, if you hear that Jesus, and let me tell you the reputation of Jesus, you must know that the reputation of Jesus was not that he only hung out with religious people. Because guess what? If he only hung out with religious people, there would be one less preacher in this room tonight. Because my Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, so without Jesus... I'd be lucky to, to squeeze my way in one of those little rooms out there. I certainly wouldn't be standing up here because I don't have anything to offer except that Jesus made the change. So watch this. The reputation of Jesus is that he cares about people, even people who are scorned. Huh? Because see, listen, let's get real. You know, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this stuff out. If the reputation of Jesus was that he looked down on sinners, you think Zacchaeus would be in a tree? Zacchaeus would be home eating the best meal that he could get, trying not to think about Jesus coming through town. But he heard that there was somebody who did not judge you, or should I say misjudge you, by your profession, or by your reputation, or by who they said you were. Jesus looked at you as you were, saw the best in you, and made it possible for you to become someone you never dreamed. So Zacchaeus, with his little short self, don't talk bad about him, he's looking good. You know, you ain't got to be tall to be good looking. Zacchaeus was ready. He was... He was matched. 
He climbs up in the tree. Somebody must say, some little kid, hey, you see that? There's a rich man in the tree. <laughs> I was going to climb in that tree, but I ain't going up there now. Something wrong with that. <laughs> you know, kids, they'll ask about, excuse me, sir, why are you up there? Aren't you rich? What are you doing up there? But when you need something that no ordinary person can supply, you'll climb a tree in good clothes. <laughs> so, so here it comes. I, I promise you, I'm at the moment now. This is when every one of us can experience the power. And here it is. Jesus walks by. The crowd is moving at a decent clip. But Jesus stops by the tree. Looks up in the tree. And you forgive me, but I get excited when I think about the moment when the eyes of Zacchaeus met the eyes of Jesus. Nothing has happened yet. But man, I can read Zacchaeus' mind. And he said, uh-oh. <laughs> He's going to say something bad about me. I shouldn't have climbed up this tree. <laughs> Is there any way I could get down from here without falling? I'm looking at him. I can't look away. He was waiting for Jesus to respond to his horrible reputation. Instead, Jesus called him by his name. <laughs> See, you think Jesus had somebody do some research like the folk on Capitol Hill when they meet you. Don't ever be impressed when somebody up there knows your name. A secretary had your name down on something, and they said, oh, the guy you're going to pass, he's a small-time preacher named Pearson. Okay? So call him by his name. Hi, how are you? Pastor Pearson. And I'm supposed to, ah, he knew me. Man, that was research, you know. They <laughs> picked me up on the way in, wrote my name down on something, and said, yeah, you'll make him feel better. Jesus has no secretary secretarial help. He has no mid-management functionaries. He has talked to his father. John chapter 1 and verse 48 says, when he met Nathaniel, he called Nathaniel by name. And Nathaniel said, how do you know my name? He said, I knew your name before you got here. In, in, this, in this crazy age of ours when everybody has become anonymous, nobody knows who you are. You start off as some crib number. Huh? Go in there and ask for your baby. They'll search all day. <laughs> but if you can give the number that corresponds with that little band on your... Baby number 438A. <laughs> oh, yes. Give us a minute and we'll... <laughs> a number. And then you, you become a, a, a social security number. And then you become a seat number. And you're in class. And you're an exam number. And you have an accident and you're a claim number and you die and you're a plot number. <laughs> Doesn't anybody know who I am? <laughs> Bible says God, God has numbered the hairs. Yes. Stick with me. Somebody thought that meant that he knew how many hairs were on your head. He has numbered the hairs on your head. So he knows that this morning you combed out numbers 3,472. <laughs> and 4,012. You tell me he doesn't know who you are? He knows your name. And even with your ubiquitous smile pasted across your face, he read your heart when you walked in the door and knew every problem that you are contemplating. He knew your fears and your victories. Jesus knows who I am. And I'm telling you that the moment to experience this power is when a righteous Jesus who has been rejected because he's too good, meets a wicked Zacchaeus who has been rejected because he's too bad. But what happens is Jesus looks in his eyes and calls his name. My man Zacchaeus held on to the tree 
because that's enough to knock you down from your perch and what I want to tell you tonight is that what Jesus did for Zacchaeus he is willing and ready to do for every one of us in this room And I, I, you know, I know you got, you got problems, you got issues. <laughs> See that man up there talking that stuff, think I'm, I believe that. Well, look, I'm, this is the real deal here. The fact is that Jesus does not love you more or less because of your reputation. He will not come closer to you because of who your parents were. He will not look at your history and then like you if you've been good, his love is unconditional. So let me set the record straight. From this night forward, I will preach many things. In fact, I can tell you that on most nights, you will have so many texts from the Bible that you will be happy that we have them printed because you won't be able to keep up with them most of you. But the fact is that anything we declare from the Word of God is not for some sacrosanct elite class of religious people. You know. And I know someone came here tonight. I hope he gets them. <laughs> I've come to see him call sin by its right name. I hope he brings down fire and brimstone on them. I hope he separates the wheat from the chaff. I hope he brings in sinners and drags them out from their dusty dark corners and exposes them to the light of God's justice. Where their sin may be consumed. Well, you don't even know the Jesus, I know. You don't even know it. Because the Bible says, and, and, and watch this, he, in this very text, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Don't speed read that. The first thing he came to do was to look for you. <laughs> he came to look for you. You've seen all those new movies where they can find you. A lady told me not long ago that they've got a way they can, can get your voice on voice print. And she said, sir, what they could do is once they had your voice on voice print, then they have satellites. They could put your, upload your voice print on satellite. And anywhere you spoke, the satellite could find you anywhere in the world. I said, then where's Bin Laden? <laughs> Tell you who can find you. Jesus can find you. Wait, wait. If they put me in jail, you may not love me anymore. You may not come to visit me, but Jesus can find me in jail. If I go out of my mind and get some habit that takes me down to the, to the gutter, they used to call it. If I get some habit that makes me so I don't have enough money to take care of myself. If I'm homeless, standing on the street corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. You may not recognize me. You may turn your head when you stop at the red light. But Jesus can find me. Not only can he find me, but he came to find me. He did not wait until I got perfect. Because if you remember what a phone booth is, does anybody remember? <laughs> Since cell phones, nobody knows them anymore. Young people, there once were things called phone booths. And you would go inside of them, 
close the door and pick up the thing and put money in. Ask your parents. Ask your grandmother about <laughs> Do you know you could get all of the perfect people on earth in a phone booth and have room? <laughs> Jesus is not waiting until you get perfect to come and get you. He came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus, come down in a hurry. Now, now forgive me, see, uh, I see the man coming down in a hurry. You got to be careful because if you come down from a tree with nice clothes on, you get your foot caught in a hem, you could break your neck coming down. And uh, if there's any time that Zacchaeus does not want to be broken in anywhere in his body, it's now because Jesus has just changed his present, his past, and his future. When Zacchaeus climbed up that tree, he was hated. But with one look in that experience the power moment, when Jesus caught his eyes and called his name, Zacchaeus changed from the most hated man in town to a brother who wasn't all that bad. You know, hey man, you hear what happened today? Zacchaeus up a tree. Jesus came to town, looked at my man, looked him straight in the eye. Who knew? He knew Zacchaeus. <laughs> Told Zacchaeus to come down in a hurry. I have never seen him move any faster. He came down and Zacchaeus and Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house and they stayed there. And, and, and look, when, when that visit was over, I, forgive me, I put the dinner in there because it rhymed. <laughs> I don't know whether they ate. But when he comes out of that house, the, the very text says that Zacchaeus stood up. Stood up. In Exodus 22 and verse 1, I'm reading from the NIV, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. So the Bible says if you know you stole, you got to give back four and fivefold. When Zacchaeus finishes talking to Jesus in the house, he comes out and stands up. Now, now stick with me. Where did all the people come from? See, do you ever ask yourself questions like that? I do. When I read the Bible, I see the whole thing. So when he came out of his house and stood up, there were people out there. Well, of course they were. The word had gone around. Guess who's in Zacchaeus' house? In fact, there were some holy people. I know holy people all the time. I know how they walk. Holy people said, if he were really the Son of God, he would never have gone to Zacchaeus' house. You know what? There are going to be some people who are going to be mad before this is over. Because Jesus is going to meet somebody in some of these 1,000 places. They may not be known as religious people. In fact, they may have a terrible reputation but somewhere at some site Jesus is gonna walk through a room and lock eyes with somebody and call you by name and say when you go home tonight they may not see me riding in your car but I'm going to your house tonight and changes will happen Zacchaeus came out and said I'll repay fourfold anything that I've stolen and when the people were angry who saw the miracle, my remark is simple. A whole lot of folk are going to be mad because you got right. And in their righteous indignation, they are going to miss the kingdom. In fact, one of my favorite writers says that some folk who were thought to be unrighteous, Jesus will look in your eyes, call you by name. You'll change because anytime Jesus gets in the house, 
you change. You'll come out different. The self-righteous will be outside waiting to give, a, give Jesus a tongue lashing. So they will miss the kingdom. While those who have met Christ for themselves will find the kingdom. And that is why I preach. Because around this world, I, I just added a country, 60 countries now. I told my wife, I want to I want to start taking before and after pictures. I've seen Jesus grab people who just came because they were curious. You know, you saw my poster. Did you see my little, little flyer? The guy who took that picture was amazing, wasn't he? Man got me looking halfway decent. So somebody said, hey, I'm going to check him out. So you just came because you were curious, but don't ever get this close because Jesus may be lurking in the room. <laughs> and when he catches your eye, you know I'm speaking now in symbolism. But the fact is that any moment of your life, Jesus could catch your eye. In fact, he may be he may have been looking for you and looking at you for months now but you never took the time to look back and so you never knew that he had caught you where you were and loved you just as you are so you didn't have to become anything for him to love you and then he says your name the most beautiful word in the English language or any other language is your name. I remember when, uh, when I had the first young lady call my name. <laughs> Gentlemen, I suppose I shouldn't tell them the whole thing, should I? But, but you stand a little straighter, you know. <laughs> You walk differently. <laughs> Ladies, you have no idea how much power you have over men. <laughs> Just say his name. And then it works the other way. There are some ladies who slouch. But when a man calls their name, it's music. I remember my mother used to call my name when I was doing something wrong. That was long ago when parents were working against the law. <laughs> My mother was a wonderful lady, but she was guilty of child abuse. My brother and I were sitting in church one day, and she didn't even have to say a word. She was sitting in the choir, and she stared at us. And I nudged my brother and said, what are we doing? He said, I don't know, but stop. When my mother would call my whole name, I knew I was in trouble. But tonight I tell you that the power point is when Jesus calls your name. I promise you, I promise you that before this series of, is over, scores of people, hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people will get caught in Jesus' eyes. And then you'll hear him call your name and you'll be transfixed. He'll say, I'm coming to your house. You'll think about the state of disarray in your house and he'll say, I don't care. I've already seen it, but I want to come there because I love you enough to ignore what your house looks like. And when Jesus gets in your house, there will be a change. That is what we will experience here and if you are willing to experience the power I want to tell you once again you don't have to be religious you don't have to be a great person you don't have to be good nobody has to go around singing your praises Jesus doesn't keep the score like people keep the score Jesus doesn't love you or not love you based on what you have done or your reputation he simply loves you because you belong to him and with that thought I end for this night and until tomorrow night 
May God hear you when you call. May God lift you if you fall. May God bless you as you stand. And may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night and God bless you. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face.